hear you. I think you might be muted. I've just committed webinar perjury. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> Um, I've done my own check and I've forgotten to unmute myself. So welcome everyone to um, the webinar. Um, and thank you very much, Claire, for that. Um, so I was just explaining to myself um, the reason why I decided to run this particular one was because I really wanted to gauge an understanding of what our suppliers were doing in order to prepare for live events. Um, this was before Boris made his announcement a couple of weeks ago um, and I'm not going to, um, to go on too long about this um, so I'm going to go straight now and introduce Claire who you just heard um, and uh, introduce our facilitator for today Claire Forestier. Um, Claire has a lot, hello Claire good morning um, Good morning, you how are you? <laughs> I'm right, thank you. Um, we're both having, we've both been having a few tech problems this morning. Um, so Claire, you've been in broadcasting for 20 years. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's more than that. I just say 20 now. So I'm just <laughs> rounding it down quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've worked for the BBC, um, commercial radio and TV, and you now run Speak Up event hosting and communications training. And I guess I, I want to ask you, Claire, this morning, in your experience, how, uh, from what you've seen, how well are people adapting to delivering online events? Um, well, they're doing it. <laughs> Whether it's always being done well is another thing. It's, you know, it's a learning curve for everybody, all the organisers and all the hosts as well, because even though we might have done the odd little virtual thing and we might have been doing the, the, some hybrid events, it's the it's the early days, isn't it? We're at the beginning of this, so it's a big learning curve, and um, it's sometimes hard to manage expectations, and it's also kind of tough to explain to people um, what can be achieved. And I think also, as we know, there's a lot of things that well, if it's online, it should be cheap and free, <laughs> and we know yeah. it takes a lot to get a good webinar online. So yeah, I, I think I'm excited. There's a few frustrations, but I think there's lots of potential. Amazing. Well, I'm going to leave um, the session in your capable hands today and I will, uh, I'll be working behind the scenes, but I will also come back and join you for the Q&A session at the end. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you. Well, it's um, an exciting day today and I will introduce the panelists to you in just a moment I have to do a, the, the sort of standard housekeeping first so so please bear with me obviously today we're using zoom the session is being recorded it's going to be available um, on, online next week early next week if you've got a question for the panel please can you submit it in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we will come to them and answer them as best we can and if you see obviously that someone's already asked, asked that question, then just do the upvote too, and then it's more likely that we'll get to that question as well. The chat function of Zoom is available, of course, so make general comments and say hi, but try not to use it for asking the questions if you can. So I'm going to um, bring on the panelists one by one now and have a little chat with them so we can see who they are. So first of all, we've got Rob Hayworth, who's our first panelist. He's a chartered health and safety advisor for event safety plan. So he specializes in advising venues, agencies, suppliers, um, and of course, event organizers in all elements of health and safety for every type of event. Hi, Rob. Morning, Claire, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you very much. Um, you look beautifully lit today. Yes, uh, well, I don't have much control over my lighting, so it's either, you, you look it's very either good on today. or on. It's on or on. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start with you, really, as we look forward to this, you know, return to live events that, that we're all talking about, event safety is going to be even more important than ever, I presume. Yeah, I think so. You know, traditionally, we've been the guys and girls at the back of the room, not with a clipboard, I don't believe in clipboards, but, you know, making sure that everybody's doing the things that they should be doing, but sort of secretly without the audiences really knowing, but I think from now on, there's going to be much more of a focus on health and safety from delegates and attendees, as well as everybody working in the industry as well. Okay, good. Oh, that's exciting. Well, it's, it's, it's going to keep us safe and it's going to keep things working. So from your point of view, it's quite, I suppose, nice. It's exciting. You're going to be, you're going to be the most important man in the room. I wouldn't go with most important, but I do know a lot more about coronavirus than I ever thought I would. Put it that way. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, thanks, Rob. So joining us now um, from Celtic Manor ICC Wales is the Head of Event Management, Leon Hughes, and 
Ella Winmouth, who is the Health and Safety Manager. So they work on huge events like NATO, Summit and the Ryder Cup, as well as thousands of national and international events. Hi, guys. Hi, morning all. Good morning. <laughs> so what are the key changes that clients are now adopting, Leon, when event planning through this pandemic? Well, through, first of all, it's finding a date. That's what the key thing is at the moment. And second guessing government guidance. But then the second conversations are about the adaptions that they have to consider um, when bringing an event to our venue. And what are we doing as a venue to support all of those health and safety considerations that are so important now that you were just talking about to Rob about. Um, those are the key things. But I think until we have um, those pioneering events that want to go ahead, um, we're all just looking into our crystal ball to know what the future might hold for us all. Okay, thank you. And, and Ella, what about you? What are the key challenges between this? You know, you've got to balance risk and the events and everything else. What, what, what are you kind of coming up with there? So I think very similar to what Rob said, really. So when reflecting over lockdown, I came to the conclusion that, well, the objective of safety hasn't really changed at all. It's just people's perception, the focus and the spotlight that's now been placed on it across the world. We have now demonstrated how integral it is, um, how it relies on everyone working together and the devastating impact that it can have if it all goes wrong. So now things that we usually keep behind closed doors, we're actively promoting and demonstrating to our clients to ensure they come back to us in the future. Yeah, because I think event organisers in the past, it was always like, you know, looking like swans sailing along with the free, frantically doing stuff underneath, almost a hidden stress. And now that has to be raised and talked about really high, doesn't it? To, yeah. To, I suppose it's a problem shared this time. <laughs> of course. All right, thank you very much, guys. We'll see you in a minute. So I'm going to have um, Ian Harvey Piper join me now. He is the Managing Director at Technovation. So he's been in live events in, as a production manager and a producer. He's telling everyone it's 35 years, so he's braver than me. And he's been involved in virtual webcasts for the last de decade. So he's now obviously like many people developing and providing virtual venues he's doing 3d venues and expos in response to the client needs and obviously the need we all have for new solutions for this new kind of events industry so hi ian good morning claire good morning and i am 35 in the business and you're definitely not so no i'm not getting there <laughs> um in some business anyway so what's the biggest issue now for all these production companies within the next few months as, as we as things keep changing i think that the biggest issue is is a lack of understanding and it's a lack of understanding from from the production companies themselves but also from clients as to what can and can't be achieved um and i think you know robbie's going to have some very salient points on that because it's we don't know what the situation is going to be on October the 1st, this massive magic day that everybody says events are going to start on October the 1st. They're not. It's as simple as that. Um, the large expos may because it's individual audiences. But our issue, our main issue is finding clients who are prepared to let their staff come into big meetings. In fact, we've only got one client at the moment who is committing to doing any kind of live event this side of, of the new year. Um, and most of our clients have said they put a complete ban on meetings of more than 10 staff. So, so it's, it's a lack of understanding mainly um, and also the eternal virtual versus hybrid versus live situation, which, um, which we'll, we'll touch on later on, I'm sure. OK, no, that's quite interesting, isn't it? How, you know, some of us are very excited, but it's whether the client is as excited as the event organisers. Yeah, they, they've got the money. Simple as that. Yeah, we have go where the money is okay no i appreciate that thank you very much okay so we will be getting you all back on in a moment but first of all we're going to have a look at our first poll which is what is your biggest concern regarding a return to live events so choose as many as appropriate it should have popped up on your screen it popped up on mine um so you've got safety of attendees safety of staff financial visibility viability rather and liability and delegate confidence. So I guess it's also client confidence too, but we'll, we'll assume that's the same thing. So if you could all give that a little bit of a, of a tick in the right places, and then when we'll give it another sort of few seconds, and then we'll try and have a little look at what, what you've all voted for, which might sort of set the tone of the conversation a little bit. So do we have enough people voting? 
I will ask the lovely people backstage to let us know. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, I just have to put my glasses on for this one. So, oh, delegate confidence is the biggest concern at 70%, as, as Rob just alluded to there, and followed closely by safety of attendees. Okay. Thank you guys, that was useful. Um, we can kind of get an idea of what you're all thinking. So I'm gonna ask um, Rob to come back to the stage now. So it wasn't um, Rob who'd mentioned that, it was Ian who'd mentioned that, apologies. Um, Rob, anyway, come back to the I'm stage. I'm gonna talk about it now, so that's fine. <laughs> that's brilliant. So Rob is gonna adjust that anyway. So, okay, your kind of question is, what as organizers should we be considering for a return to live events? Take it away and I will sure. come Sure, I mean, it's, it's very telling that the, um, uh, the poll there just showed across the, the sort of top two um, uh, most popular sort of choices are specifically around um, our audiences and our delegates and them having the confidence and the faith that we can uh, that we can deliver uh, the events that we said that we can. I mean, we've had some very positive news in the last few weeks. Um, we've got this magical 1st of October date that we are working towards. But I know for a lot of people, there's still definitely some uncertainty and there's some ongoing challenges as well. And that challenge, uh, amongst many others, is, is simply the, the guidance that we've got at the moment and, and is applicable to some events and not others. is causing quite a lot of confusion. And certainly we as um, event safety advisors to venues and agencies uh, and, in, and freelancers and, and, and technical providers, we're just getting bombarded with questions now with some very nuanced, what can we do? What can't we do? Um, I want to do X, Y, Z in a particular place. And what are the permissions that are in place? And it is very confusing. And to be honest, even though we do it all the time, we're still struggling to keep up with, with all of the information that's coming through. But I think one of the key things that we have to bear in mind is that the responsibility now falls to us as an industry to be able to communicate effectively with our delegates, and communicate effectively with our customers and with the venues and the other people that we're working with, that we do have a plan of action. And it means that for the first time, health and safety is actually going to be one of the factors I think that will uh, people will consider when whether they're gonna to come to an event or not. So in the past, it might've been, uh, I want to see a particular speaker on a topic, or it might've been my favorite band are playing at a music festival. But I think that going forward, people are generally going to consider, will I or members of my team or members of my family be safe at this event? Is it something that we, uh, that we feel confident in? And I think that that's gonna be something that gets drawn throughout all of the um, considerations of, of, of when people are putting on their programs and will form part of the marketing information um, and sort of part of the sales presentation. And in fact, we're working with one of our clients at the moment who uh, are using effectively a uh, COVID management plan as a sales tool to demonstrate to people that they um, actually are going to be safe and that there are people in the background thinking about how to keep everybody uh, doing the right things and making sure that the things are in the right places. So that communication is going to be absolutely key um, before the event on the day. And I know that the, uh, the guys from ICC Wales are going to talk about that as well as the sort of from the venue perspective, but it's also about getting support as well. So if there are areas where um, uh, people don't really understand or don't know what they can and can't do. There's lots of information out there, whether it's Facebook groups, uh, HSE websites, the various associations that can be joined. Um, they've all got good, solid information out there that can be used um, to try and draw together um, this kind of reactive situation we find ourselves in where we're still trying to understand and still trying to get a better understanding of what we can and can't achieve and the dates and the deadlines that we're gonna have for that. And as we found over the last few weeks and months, the information tends to come out quite late in the day and we have to be more reactionary than we'd like to be as, as, as safety people and as event professionals who obviously plan for a living. Planning is proving to be quite tricky at the moment. Um, so I think it really is important that um, there's a level of um, assurance and reassurance to all the people that are working on a project, all the people that are attending a project, and that that's communicated clearly and effectively with written documentation, uh, induction programs. Um, one of our clients has produced videos for their venues to show people what they're doing. So there are ways that you can uh, really reassure people that your event is going to be a safe place for them to be. Um, but I also think it's important that we talk about mental health at this point, and I haven't got long to discuss it, but I do think that now more than ever, as financial pressures um, and just isolation working at home, in an industry that's already full of stress and high pressure situations, we really do need to be looking out for each other. So um, 
do pick up the phone to your colleagues, do make sure that everybody is, is in a good place because ultimately it's not a good time for the industry and we really need to pull together because ultimately there won't be an industry w without us all. Um, I can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. Um, as long as we stay with our relative little local lockdowns, I think we're in a good place as an industry, but things change at the drop of a hat. Um, and usually it seems to be at midnight. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on the current situation, Claire. Okay, thank you very much. Um, everyone's being a bit shy with their questions at the moment. Um, <laughs> it always takes a while, a while for them to warm up. So you'll probably face some more in a minute. But sure. yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you, because obviously you're going to get asked this at dinner parties everywhere you go, if you're going to dinner parties or you're going out and about. What, no what do you... <laughs> yeah, no more than six people. What do you realistically think is going to happen? What's your, you must have your own little personal prediction. Well, the challenge is we, we as a company, there's a team of us who, who do this, we, we are reacting very much at the moment to things that come out. So, um, for example, we've got two drive-in movies that are running at the moment, which have been running for a number of weeks now because they were one of the first things that we could get going. But we found out with about four days notice that the permission was going to be granted for those to take place. But of course, we'd already done two months work on the anticipation that it might happen. Mm. But then the guidance came out, then the guidance was revised, then the guidance was revised again. So we're trying to keep on top of things. Um, the hope that I've got is, and I think the, the general understanding needs to be that the way the law will work on this in terms of the uh, liability and the um, um, requirements of event organisers is, is no different to existing health and safety law. The existing health and safety law will tell you you've got to keep your delegates safe, you've got to keep your staff safe, you've got to have a management process. That won't change. What they won't do, and they don't do at the moment, is tell you how to do that. Mm. So there won't be any specifics around um, you must wear masks, you must not wear masks, you must do temperature checking, you must not do it. That won't happen. It will be down to an individual company or organisation or events team to come up with those solutions. And as long as they can demonstrate that they've got sufficient understanding of what the, the situation is um, and they've been and sought help and they've got third party, you know, from a HSC website, there's lots of guidance out there. As long as they've done enough, it should be okay. But the, the worry I think I've got is that it, it's a new set of learning, even for the likes of myself, who's been doing, well, events for 20 years and safety for 10. We're still learning it as, as, as time goes on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all, yeah, it's an impossible situation still, isn't it? It's just no certainty at the moment. But as you say... I'm a planner. I've been planning for, yeah. for, you know, for work for, for 20 odd years. And I remember sitting at home late March, early April, thinking... I can't plan and you know and as I said sort of mentally just being able to cope with the fact of so much uncertainty for a group of people watching this I'm sure who plan stuff to minute detail for a living mm -hmm. is a very difficult place to be. Yes we've, we've got um, a question now from um, Hannah Dwyer who says what are the key things event planners are looking for from venues and also how do we balance the need to put procedures in place for attendee safety against still providing the engaging experience? I think the key thing here is that it has to be pretty much a partnership between the event organiser and the venue. Purely from a legal perspective, it's not one or the other who would either do good or do bad in that situation. So it needs to be a case of the organiser will do a risk assessment of some sort, the venue will do some, and then those two pieces of information need to, become, need to come together so that they're not working independently of each other, because they could be working against each other in some situations. So more so than ever before, working alongside the venue to ensure everybody's safety is going to be a really key factor, I think. Okay, um, I'm not sure if, um, yeah, oh no, sorry, there's another one here. Is there a way to try to get in on government conversations? <laughs> who, who can sort of know, you know, who's, the word, who's got the word on the street or the ear, I suppose? Well, um, funny, so there's more enough, notice. I think the challenge is that there isn't any notice. I think the problem is that actually a lot of this documentation and guidance is being generated very last minute. And I know that for a fact, because we commented on and were um, feeding back on some of the documentation before it came out. We got asked as part of the groups that we're in um, for um, our sort of understanding and guidance. And one of the pieces of work that came out was a couple of pages long. Our version that we'd written internally for using with our clients was something like 50. So we'd mm. already gone to that next step. And I think the challenge is, like anything, and let's not get into the politics of it because we'll be here for the rest of the week. Um, it, rightly or wrongly, the government, I, my opinion, my opinion only, not necessarily that of anybody else, are doing best that they can with the information that they've got in the timescales that they can deal with, but they're on the back foot and they're going to be on the back foot because this wasn't something that any of us predicted and was none of our fault. 
there are there is a lot of work going on in the background um well above my sort of level in terms of you know the associations i know that the bvp dcms they're all working together but actually because they're on the back foot the documentation is finished and then it gets published pretty much instantaneously so right. there is no lead time i don't think okay okay all right thank you that is really interesting i'm looking forward to you guys having your panel discussion in a minute as well because i think there's yeah, it'll be an interesting to share one on that. Thank you so much. So um, we are now going to have a quick look at our second poll, which hopefully will be coming up now. Is the poll there? Mm. Claire, we're going to ICC Wales next. Oh, OK, we're not looking at a where. Oh, sorry, return to live events poll is going to be coming up in a minute. Apologies about that misunderstanding. So we're actually going to go over now to talk to... Um, Leon and Ella again and find out what the uh, International Convention Centre for Wales, the ICC, is doing to prepare for a return to live events. So hi Leon and, and hi Ella again. I will hi. leave you guys to, to tell us all. Thanks Claire, thank you. Um, I mean it's been a long journey coming through this um, these last three months. Um, but we've been paying close attention here to all of the reports that have been coming out from um, DCMS, BVEP, all the other abbreviations, Visit Britain, Visit Wales, um, UK government, but we have the devolved nation as well of Welsh government. So we're having to keep track of, um, of the changes that are coming out of our Senate here in Wales. Um, we're also paying close attention to what the internationals are doing. So we can learn lots from international venues as well, who are slightly ahead of us in all of this. Um, and our membership of the AEV has been such a key resource um, for us through, through learning um, what we can do as a venue to support, but also standardize a lot of what venues have to do to support client events returning. Um, that has most definitely been um, the most resourceful place for us. And with that, I've been sat on a working group that's been focusing on writing documentation that will bring back live events to venues and standardise them for all UK venues. So clients have some familiar parity if they're delivering an event here or at any other of the key UK venues. Um, and with that, we've written our own reopening guidelines and implemented our own um, four corners, four pillars of uh, measures that we have to roll out here to um, support everything from the typical cleaning and hygiene measures that everybody expects to social distancing, um, the protect and detect element and the key piece of communication as well and that reassurance building. Um, and with that, um, I'll ask Ella to talk a bit more next on the cleaning measures that we've implemented here at the um, at ICC Wales and across at our sister venue, Celtic Manor, as well. So at ICC Wales, um, we have implemented enhanced cleaning regimes and continuous cleaning throughout events. So where it would start is when an event moves in, we would have deep cleaned all areas that those events are working in. We would then redo that before the event starts to ensure it's a safe environment for everyone. And then during during the event, we won't only increase waste management, we would also um, implement a HIP cleaning protocol, which focuses on high impact touch points. So your door handles, um, your lift buttons, anything such as that. Um, all those key areas will also have hand sanitation stations, um, disposable wipes if you require it. Um, we've also worked really far towards um, reducing the amount of shared facilities within rooms. So any of the pens and notepads and papers have now been removed, they've been replaced. So any print work has been replaced with QR codes. And the last thing really has been um, our air purification systems and our ventilation. So I think we all know that COVID can transfer in the air and stay in the air for a long period of time. Um, but um, we also have to look at our filtration systems as well. And then I'm going to move back on to back over to Leon for social distancing. Thanks. We're very lucky here at ICC Wales on that point, Ella, about the air purification. And um, with building regulations as they are at the moment um, in today's world, the building is flushed with fresh air very regularly. 
um, and there's a system designed, Ella will be able to tell me more about this, but a system that's designed to um, pull fresh air through the building. So there's a constant change of air throughout the whole space. So we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, whereas some buildings that were built in old regulation, of course, don't have such, um, such facility. Um, but the social distancing measures is the second pillar of, that we're focusing our attention on here. Um, one of the key parts of the social distancing measures, of course, is the minimum distance that we're being guided by government at which we should approach. So in Wales, it's still sat at two metres. And what that means based on crowd density standards that each person needs four square metres. So you can imagine that diminishes capacities of some huge spaces quite significantly. Um, and by reducing that to one metre, um, which they've done across the border in England, um, that allows greater capacities to be increased. So that's one of the key pieces that um, the AEV and AEO lobbied as part of those um, standardised measures that were signed off by DCMS. Um, but other measures that can support it, we um, are very lucky we've got ample external space as well. Um, so queuing for registration systems can be set up, but we will work with event organisers to actively encourage um, advanced online registration or maybe even simpler um, systems that I've seen uh, that allow check in to an event just by simply clicking a QR code upon a door on entry. Um, so there's all sorts of technologies that will support those registrations. Um, and also allowing clients and working with clients to increase their registration window. Gone are the days I think that we'll see um, an hour's registration window to get a thousand delegates through a, through a small space and get them straight into a plenary session. Those windows of registration need to be opened up much further. But we do have registration desks here, of course, and if they're in place, then we've fitted those with um, protection screens. Um, we have the ability, um, Ella already mentioned this, the lifts that are across the venue and the escalators that are across the venue, they've all been adapted to minimise the, um, the people that are using the lifts and the distance at which people jump on escalators. Um, all those common things that are now we would never have thought about, but now are so prevalent wherever we visit. Um, and we'll also work whilst we've already put signage in place to create one-way systems through public areas when clients are floor planning their events we'll work with them to encourage one-way systems um, using different entry points exit points to the different to the different spaces that they're um, taking tenancy of um, and as well as visible active signage across the venue to remind us of all of these social distancing measures, we're also using our public address system to send out some pre-records just to remind people of policy that might be in place about the social distancing, the no handshake policy that we have to have at the moment. But ultimately, as relaxation happens, clients might still wish to reassure delegates um, to attend their event that it's still safe to do so and by um, using that public address system we can address some of their um, policies. Uh, so we're really using the digital technology that's been built into the venue to support all of that as well as using it to stream across the venue um, to break down the need of closed plenaries, creating listening rooms or lounges across the venue or even streaming out to the internet using some of the technology that um, I think Ian will go on to talk about later. Um, but yeah, those are all the social distancing measures that we're rolling out. Um, and then the, four, the third pillar, um, I'm going to ask Ella to talk a bit more on about the protect and detect measures that we're putting in place. So yeah, as Leon was saying, we've invested an awful lot in our digi digital technology, including purchasing thermal imaging cameras. So this is via a CCTV camera. You wouldn't even notice it was there, but they're installed in every entrance to the building. So we are actively um, actively monitoring if anyone coming into the building is suggesting that they have a fever. Obviously, this is very dependent on skin surface temperature. However, um, they will be asked if they would allow for a period of rest in a quarantined area, and then they'll be retested if they did first present with a fever. Um, we've also looked into face masks. I know it's a very controversial um, topic right now. However, um, all of our staff, all the venue staff will be wearing face masks in all public areas and whilst they're commuting across the venue. We'll also 
be working with um, event organisers to see whether they want to make it mandatory for all of their guests to um, wear face masks and these will also be available to purchase whilst on site if required. Um, we will have um, we'll have emergency response plans if anyone do, does start to present with symptoms of COVID-19 when they are in the building and we have quarantine areas available for that. Um, we also screen all of our employees, they have advanced training before attending um, their first day of work and they have regular screening of travel and health. Um, and finally, we work with, we're working in conjunction with the Welsh Government um, on their Track, Trace and Protect scheme, which we're implementing with event um, organisers across um, the event. So we will work with them, like Leon was mentioning earlier, with access through QR codes and registration through QR codes on entrance. We'll be working in conjunction with the event organisers to be able to um, make this happen and ensure that we can track everyone coming in and out of the business at any one time. Um, and now, I now think that Leon's going to talk about communication with guests and how important it should be. I'm first going to show you this. Rob wanted me to flash our back to work <laughs> pack that we're all being issued with. Um, it contains our face masks that we need and um, a face strap for those that don't want to wear um, wear it behind their ears and a hand sanitizer that we carry with us at all times and what's been labeled a hygiene key. I don't know if anybody's seen those, um, but it's a little hook that allows you to pull a door open, push a door open, tap your code in to, um, to your printer, whatever it is you need to use it for it. Just avoid, They are so. really handy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are indeed. Um, and that track trace piece, it ties in neatly to the fourth pillar of um, what we're working on here in our guidelines, which is the communication piece. Um, Rob already mentioned um, elements of it, um, but communication is key and it's joining up the communication lines between us as a venue, um, clients occupying our space and delivering events within them to give reassurance to delegates that it is safe to return to live events. And with those track trace systems, it's a bit of a, um, a hot topic and who wants to own that compliance of GDPR for owning that data. Um, but ultimately, we need to work together with clients to um, ensure that we have that data to make it a safe space for anybody visiting. Um, but it's key, communication is so key at this point to give that reassurance from advanced messaging about the measures that we have in place about all of these factors that we're talking about here so that clients have some reassurance that they're coming to a safe venue um, through clients, including data within their exhibitor manuals, for example, about me measures that exhibitors within their own stand booths can take to ensure that they're keeping their space safe. Um, I mentioned that public address system as well, using that to um, send out the messaging, reinforcing the, the policies of maybe a client wishes to you enforce face masks at, at their event. Um, and then the key track and trace system, it all links in very, um, very neatly together, um, both in advance of an event, during an event and the post event wrap up as well. It's key that um, reassurance is given at every level. Um, and those, that's pretty much everything that we're doing. We're focusing on those four pillars. We're adopting industry standards, um, what will become industry standards for any members of the AEV, any venues that are working with the AEV. Um, and we've extracted from that, um, that ready to go, safe to go um, framework to safely open. And we're ready. We really do want to deliver events. We just need one client to pioneer the way and lead us to, um, to our post-COVID event. Thanks, Claire. Hi, guys. Thank you. Oh, I love that little plea at the end. <laughs> I got the kit there because I don't think I saw that. It was because you were hidden by the screen a bit. That it's like a little back to work pack. It is. It is. And in here, there's also a, a letter from our CEO and a little, a little neat little booklet to tell you how you how you and should what's work the safely. Little finger thing. What's oh, the let me show. Thing? Let good. me show you. Digging deep in the box, there. It's a um, little safety key. You hook it onto your set of keys, then you can use it to hook a door open, or Great. push a door open, or if you've got to key something in, you can use it to key something in. It looks like a kind of little sort of emergency festival pack when you don't want to touch things <laughs> yeah. at festivals or things like that. That would be really handy. It does, doesn't okay. it? Okay. 
It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be extraordinary, isn't it, when, they, when they're when they all back. But, you know, as you said, you're excited. You want someone to take the plunge there. Yes. Um, yeah, it's that's the one, isn't it? Someone has to be brave enough to do it. Well, so, I was optimistic. We had um, an international um, exhibition due to take place in October, and they were really keen, really keen to go ahead, driving ahead. They're, they're, their um, worldwide HQ was pushing them from the States to go ahead. And then, of course, the announcement came that it would be the 1st of October and they felt that it was just a little bit too close to be the first mm. to go ahead and they pulled. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that's the case. Everybody's had that experience. You know, we're not alone there. And I think um, everybody's in that same boat. They've just spent the, the last three months finding new dates to run events. Well, I think as well, it will be reassuring for people listening who are, you know, you guys are big boys. You've got a massive venue there and you do mm. huge events. So I think that it'll be <laughs> helping you, but it might be reassuring to some of the smaller venues listening that it's that it is across the board, this experience. Indeed. We've had a couple of questions come in. So I wanted to ask you. So um, so this is someone um, I can't seem to see their name, actually. It might just be my screen. So apologies if their name is on there. I can't see it. But they've said, as event planners, will we need to take into account a longer turnover period between events? I, a venue is going to say we'll sell a space for just 24 hours for one event rather than multiple events per day in the same space. You know, you could have several clients coming in and doing mm -hmm. different events. Will they say, no, this venue can only be this client today and longer times for cleaning and that kind of thing. Is that going to, do you think that might happen? We will naturally have to adopt longer cleaning regimes. Our standard tenancy is seven, um, seven, seven. Um, so we'll maintain that. If, um, if tenancy needs to be extended beyond that, then we'll adapt our time frame accordingly and whether that means an increase in staffing resource because we don't have the time resource we will measure it to ensure that um that that's balanced and obviously all these things are going to be costing you money and mm. you're going to pass that directly on to the client presumably well no um one of the hotly debated topics was ella mentioned in the thermal imaging cameras some venues have that's not a mandatory that was actually taken out of the guidance by government they removed that as a mandatory feature but we've kept it as a feature within our guidance to give extra levels of reassurance um some venues have also left it in but whereby they have the luxury of typically one client in one space they have the ability to um, put that cost down to a client but we have multiple clients across multiple spaces so we've adopted that cost internally um, so that's our cost for example amongst many others fair enough yeah it's 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 difficult to pass that on and i mean i just just a classic example i went to get my teeth cleaned the other day and it was 25 quid more no. um yeah because they've added on all these extra bits and bobs and i guess private clinics or whatever can do that it's um, yeah it'd be yeah. very difficult a bit of a shock when the bill came i was like i was expecting maybe a fiver extra not 25 yeah quid. we haven't adapted any of our rate policy to account for any of the extra extra measures that are We're in place at all to suck it up yeah. mm, because clients are you know clients are being hit as well because mm. because of this social distancing measure that i've mentioned about crowd density their capacity is limited within our spaces so they're not able to um, down sell the registration fee so they're not getting the revenues in either so everybody is losing out at the moment nobody's winning in this game so we're all just trying to make it a safe space in which events can run at every level okay i had another question here that i, I might ask you if signing a contract now for a 2021 event will we have to agree the capacity allowed currently or are venues allowing a flexibility to take into account possible future spikes in the pandemic and or changes in attendee guidelines that's from jude corns yeah we're um we're remaining totally flexible to support clients in their future events we're we're contracting based on a normal world at the moment but um knowing that capacity well knowing that capacities may well be hindered because of social distancing measures in place um so they are flexible terms and we've written into um our future contracts um a term that does allow any resurgence of covid19 um it allows clients to reduce or release without penalty right okay okay all right fair enough so yeah that was a another quick question was that but i think you've answered it was our venues keeping the same room rates despite drops in capabilities um 
we are because the spaces don't change what changes is the limitations that are put upon upon us as a venue yeah. as and clients as to what covid measures we have to adopt okay. um, and namely that is the social distancing piece which we hope will continue to um to drop we, our first minister is making his next legal review at 12 30 so i'm eagerly awaiting um some news on that topic mm -hmm. today Oh, great. Yeah, exciting. OK, well, look, we're going to move on now. Can have a quick look at our second poll, which is when will your first live event be? And then I will ask Ian Harvey Piper to join us. So here's the return to live events. When will be you be running your next live event? It's pretty straightforward. Quarter three this year, quarter four this year, quarter one next year, quarter two next year or even later. So quick, everybody, make your mark. Tell us what you think. Your next live event, when will it be? And then we can have a quick look at the results before we hear from Ian. So let's go and look at the events now. <laughs> I love this power. I'm not pressing any buttons. Here we go. Oh, OK. Everyone is looking quarter one next year. So, OK, that, that is very interesting and in line with what I'm hearing as well. Not that that makes much difference. It's not a, it's not a proper poll, but this is really interesting. Thank you guys. Okay, so I'm gonna ask Ian if he could come back now and tell us what Technovation is doing to prepare for a return to live events. Thank Are you, Claire. You Hi. Um, well, <laughs> in light of that survey result, um, I'm not quite sure if we're doing anything. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we're looking at, hopefully getting back to live shows um, in November. Uh, that's when our first clients are looking at, at doing a live show. And looking at it from a, a technical AV point of view and the rules that we have to put in place, aside from any of the venue rules, it's what we do with the equipment and what we do with the crew. So with equipment, microphones, etc., using lapel microphones is going to be uh, put into the, the background, I think, and we're going to be using fixed microphones a lot more. Um, so that we don't need to go uh, right up close and have contact with presenters. Um, remote clickers um, and slide cures, um, what we're, we're looking at using are um, web-based clickers on mobile phones so that everybody has their own mobile phone and we use those phones to advance the slides rather than giving them a classic cue light. So it's trying to keep as much distance from presenters as possible um, we obviously need to look at all the regulations with distances of presenters on a stage. Do the stages need to be further back from the front rows? So there's lots and lots of considerations, stuff that Rob's been talking about, stuff that Leon's been talking about. So we have to follow in their footsteps. The, the other thing that, that people aren't really talking about is crew uh, and that how do you use uh, crew on site? Do they need to bubble? Uh, do they need to wear full PPE and what about social distancing for crew? So we've looked at the possibility of, of having groups of crew that were going to go out on specific shows so that if one person develops symptoms, it means we can isolate the whole crew that went on that show and put another crew in place. It's not cheap. Um, sometimes it's not that practical, but it's the only way we can do it. And certainly on a road show, where you're going to several different venues in you know, one every other day, then if, if a crew person does develop a temperature or whatever, we have to swap those people out immediately. And they're gonna be off the road for a week or 10 days now as the, as the new regulations are. And that's the other problem. Regulations are changing all the time. So we've gone from seven days isolation to now 10 days isolation. Um, by October the 1st, this magic date as we're all talking about, it could be 14 days, it could be 21 days, it could be no isolation because two months seems to be a very, very long time, unfortunately. So that's what we're looking at in the, the, the hardware side of things. Um, with the crew and the bubbles, there's also the question of, of humpers and casual labor. You can't just book half a dozen guys or girls to come on site and help unload a van. With track and trace, you've got to know who those people are in advance. Have they had any symptoms and everything like that? So it's, it's a very, very complicated system to get AV production back on the road, unfortunately. But we're doing our best and we'll see how it works. Um, unfortunately for us as a production company, about 30, 35% of our work is, is based in Europe and in, in other continents. So unfortunately, that's 
totally gone. I mean, we're not even contemplating a return to any European or, or continental shows, at least until probably Q2 2021, simply because, again, with the, uh, the quarantine rules changing uh, day by day, as it is certainly for all the holiday makes at the moment, we can't risk sending a truck abroad um, and then it may be getting stuck there or the, the driver having to quarantine for 14 days when they get back. So unfortunately, foreign shows and, and all the foreign trips for us as a production company have gone, um, which is a great shame because they were the, the fun ones to do. Um, so how do we move forward from that? Unfortunately, we are in the virtual world and everybody has become a virtual expert in the last four months. Um, there, every production company that used to do live event is now doing virtual events. And if you look at any of the social media uh, chat rooms and, and, and groups, all it takes is one person to put out a message saying, I need a virtual platform, and you are inundated with 50, 60, sometimes 70 re responses. So everybody has their own take on it. Everybody is, is now an expert, unfortunately. And, and as you said at the, at the beginning of, of this program, we are learning as we go along. People haven't been in this industry for more than four months, effectively. So there is still so much to learn. My worry is that by the time anybody actually does become expert in this, it won't be necessary anymore because we're going to go back to live events, which is what we all wish. But we have to see. Nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, I believe that virtual is here to stay, um, but it will go hybrid. I think these kind of, of webinars and seminars are very, very useful. It, it, lets people have far more uh, access to them and you can have presenters on a, on a webinar that you could never normally get into a room because of time commitments and you get an audience who can be worldwide based and not just in the room in the venue so virtually is here to stay but the dreaded word i'm afraid and um, we probably won't get onto this in too much detail today but the dreaded word is hybrid and and it's <sighs> It's not as easy as pointing a camera at a stage and transmitting it. Hybrid is a totally different way of working. It is taking a complete live event and a complete virtual event and melding them together, but they're totally different events with the same content. So I think that as a, as a final comment from me here, hybrid is going to be the way that the industry goes for the next year or two, but we so, so have to look at it carefully and be prepared to pay for it and be prepared to work very hard at making a hybrid show work. So that, that's the future, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I love the dreaded hybrid word. <laughs> the dreaded hybrid word. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a, quite a lot of, you know, it can be a bit contentious because some people love the idea of it, but as you say, it's got to be done properly and people just, you can't just say, oh, look, this is hybrid when it's essentially just a TV program online. It needs to be so much more than that. Absolutely. And, and, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's not just a TV broadcast. That is what virtual is now. That is what all virtual should be. It should be a TV broadcast. But hybrid, you have to keep the online uh, audience uh, enthused and uh, active, but you also have to keep the in the venue audience enthused. And it's a totally different um, way of working. Yeah. Watching a theatre show is totally different to watching a film or watching a TV program. And that's the problem. If you watch a theatre show on TV, as, as the National Theatre were doing at the beginning of lockdown, yes, you could watch the show, but it had none of the atmosphere. And, and you, yeah. you, you were watching a very two-dimensional program. Whereas actually, if you're in the theatre, you can see everything around you. And that is where hybrid is going to have the problems of people understanding how to make two totally different uh, environments work as one. Well. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, we've got a question or two, and then I will get everybody else back on board. So, one of the questions I think it's relevant for you do you foresee any issues with venue infrastructures to support hybrid event formats in terms of live streaming event content for a start? That's anonymous asking that one. So. I, I think not problems. I think every venue is going to have to seriously look at their, their mm. broadband connection. Um, and look at the prices of their broadband connection. Some venues are great. Some venues have great Wi-Fi and they will give you dedicated Wi-Fi for your particular event. Um, 
other venues will say, yeah, you can have a hardwired broadband connection of, of five meg and they're going to charge you 600 pounds mm. for it and you need to give them four weeks notice. So I think that the main thing from venues is going to have to be that broadband connection and, and to be honest, giving it for free. Yeah. But I think that's also a political decision because I think the government have to look at how broadband is provided throughout the country and to venues. Oh yeah, well, the, the, I think this has taught it today. <laughs> All I know is where I am, the entire fibre or whatever they call it has gone down. So we've lost it in the whole area I'm in if, on a certain thing at the moment. So Well, same here. I'm, I'm working thank, on a, a mobile internet today because my God internet went this. down two days ago. <laughs> As an event host, I need something. <laughs> I was in like panics. Yeah, so it's really interesting. That's opened up a whole other a whole other issue. But that base, it's basic hygiene now. Venues are going to have to have that at the very, very least. Mm. Um, okay, thank you. So... Um, are venues requesting COVID-19 RA from event planners prior to confirming bookings? Is that probably not relevant so much for you on that one? But, um... Um, to be honest, because we haven't done a live event since the beginning of March, um, it's been actually quite nice uh, not having to fill out the health and safety forms. <laughs> um, certainly risk assessments to do with online and virtual work that we're doing. Um, but no, uh, we've, we've had a nice little break from, from the majority oh, of health and safety documentation. Risk assessment's always the fun bit, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and a whole new, whole new extra section on risk assessment now as well. Okay, brilliant. So um, we've got some other questions coming in, but I'll get everybody else to join us back on stage. Um, here's lovely Rob. You came in very bright there. And the other Rob and Leon. So guys, um, with Andrea, um, oh, and Ella, there she is. I'm, I'm just going to go with this question first because Andrea asked it a while ago. Um, is there any guidance with regards to garden parties and business events run outdoors in that sort of setting, please? Rob H, would you love to ask that, please? Well, it's complicated. So I can give you an actual example that we're working through at the moment with a client who is trying to do an event uh, uh, at a private residence, but it is a business event but it is at someone's house, but it is for more than six people, at which point it starts to get really complicated. So at private houses at the moment, you're not allowed to have um, business events. And so therefore you're not allowed to have more than the family groups and the bubbles and the numbers are still up in the air. If you class it, however, as a business event at a business venue and you're outside, then at the moment there's actually no restriction on the number of people you can do as long as it is effectively well organized COVID secure and has an organization in place to run, you know, that event. I am only speaking for England at the moment, of course, Scotland and well, Wales is different. Yeah, across the border here, 30 yes. people can meet outdoors from any number of households, but provided they maintain two metres apart. So across the border and have your party in Wales. <laughs> the trouble is there is no one size fits all at the moment. So we are, for each of our clients, pretty much on each of the different uh, scenarios that they're working on, we are as you would with any risk assessment, of course. And Ian, I was crying slightly as you said you were excited about not doing risk assessment. Um, uh, we, we, we have to tailor our advice pretty much to every single individual uh, option. And then for one of our clients at the moment, we are writing them four different scenarios for their events next summer so that they can present those to the different venues that they're going to and saying, we'll do one of them. We just don't know which one yet. Goodness me. It's so much more work you're all taking on, isn't it? And of course, when you now deliver a proposal to somebody, you've got to take all this amount. So you're, it's, it's literally lo loading and loading on the, the life of the poor event organiser, isn't it? Rob, how have you, how's all this affecting you? What, what are you thinking about this moving forward when you working with your clients, this kind of added job, this extra stuff that's going on? Because you can't really pass that on to the client, the costs. Um, well, it's incredibly complicated because we need to look at it from a number of different different scenarios. Um, first of all, as most of you know, we work with associations. So the first question is financial viability of any event. You know, if you are if you have to keep everybody within a four square meter bubble, that means your capacity is reduced. Therefore, you can't have as many people in. So it's harder to reach that that break even point, which um, which all of our clients want need to be able to reach in order to be able to run their their, their events. That that's the the, the first consideration. Um, but then moving on to the practical implications, um, we are in the middle of considering things such as you know um, um, on site testing. Um, 
um, on-site whistleblowing. So if somebody, if a delegate sees somebody else who is mm. displaying symptoms, then what must they do? Rob, are you warm or are you just, that scares the life out of you? Um, um, but then there's also liability. You know, actually, if, if something has to be cancelled or pulled, whose decision is it and who has the liability for that decision, both financial and uh, uh, legally? And it's, uh, it gets so complicated that it, you're, it's almost like a, it feels like an impossible wall to get through, to actually get to a point where everybody, all your stakeholders are comfortable in moving forward and to actually deliver live. In some instances, running from a corporate perspective, running an event from a, for a corporate would be a lot easier because you've got one, one decision maker and effectively they are, they are calling all the shots. But with an association, it's so much more, more difficult. That's fascinating what you know, that point there of people dobbing everybody in like the Stasi or whatever, or someone has a cough. I had that woman coughing. Um, yeah, that, that's an eye opener, isn't it? How on earth do you legislate for things like that, Ian? And then at your event, what would you do at your, at your venue? Uh, to be honest, oh, Ian, right. but people aren't going to even do that in shops. Yeah. yeah, you've got this whole attitude at the moment about wearing masks in shops. Um, and people saying, I'm, I'm not going to implement that or I'm not going to wear a mask. And you know, a friend of mine posted this morning that they went to Tesco's and there were loads of people without masks. You can't dob people in in a supermarket. You're not going to dob people in in a conference environment because um, also in a conference environment, you are with your peers and, and everybody knows each other effectively. I suppose you could then say, uh, look, you're not wearing a mask or, you know, I heard you cough, are you OK? But it, you can't put that responsibility onto, onto the general public and onto delegates. I really don't believe you can. And we can do it with, the, with our crew, you know, because we'll be looking out for each other. And we can, we can look around the audience because, you know, we have that opportunity to look at audience throughout an event. But, but as regards policing it, that is a, that is a very grey area, very grey area. One of the things that's coming out of the US is having a person or people on site um, and it's not my title, I've got to read it. An infection mitigation controller is what they uh, are talking about. And a lot of the film studios are doing it. Disney have been recruiting people into this specific role. And actually that's a, that's a, a safety type role, but specifically looking at the management processes around exactly what we're talking about here. What happens, what, how do you stop things going wrong and what do you do if something does go wrong? So it's something that you've got to consider but is that going to be financially viable for smaller events? Larger events, it could well be, you know, uh, but for, for smaller events, it's going to be more difficult. But we're, we're also looking at one of the fundamental issues where, or another fundamental issue is that we're potentially looking at a conflict situation. So if a delegate has paid a ticket, sometimes thousands pay for a registration fee, sometimes thousands of pounds to attend a, a Congress and they turn up, and the per and you know we're talking at the moment about training our our frontline staff, our registration staff to spot COVID symptoms. If they're displaying symptoms, then we can reserve the right to refuse entry to that that event, and we should do. But then that's creating a conflict issue, um, and that's incredibly difficult to resolve because. So where someone has symptoms, that's very personal, and it might be something completely different, completely unrelated. You know, they may have, for example, bad asthma that, that morning, but we don't, we don't have a choice. I don't feel we have a choice about that than other to just say, no, you can't come in. Guys, They're I very just, simple. Before you go there, sorry, I just realised the time. So um, we are going to continue talking for another 15 minutes or so, but I appreciate that we were due to finish at 11. Rob probably has a few words for you and then we'll come continue with the questions. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, first of all, thanks so much to the panellists, to Ian, to um, who is actually on holiday this week. So thank you very much for giving your time up, Ian. Uh, to Rob, uh, to Leon and to Ella. And of course, a massive thank you to Claire for facilitating professionally and eloquently as usual. Um, Tara, if we could have slides, please. Um, I... Um, 
I had a, the reason this slide is up is because actually I had some feedback from the last webinar that we did that at the end of it, people thought we were an association. Um, so I just to spell out, Brighton, which is my company, um, we're, um, we're an event services company, a professional conference organizer specializing in working with associations, um, delivering both live and online events across seven different service areas. Um, that's the official plug down now. Uh, we'll move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we also have a sister company, which is the event training company, which we launched la last month. Um, short, sharp vocational based training for the events industry. Um, we've, we're launching a course a month at the moment. The current course instruction to online event management has currently had around 70 people take it no more than that 80 people take that so far and we're launching a new course in a couple of weeks time called introduction to sponsorship and exhibition sales um, which is really for anyone who just wants to find out a bit more about how how it all starts and brush up on some sales skills as well uh, next slide please thanks um, and the final my final slide is um, that I said at the beginning of the session we'll be taking a break in August um, our next webinar will be on the 25th of September and actually before today I was wondering what subject we were going to do it on uh, but I think we're going to talk about how to make hybrid events work or some title along that um, that subject so I may well be inviting you Ian back um, to talk about that um, on that if you're if you're available uh, but for now um, absolutely <laughs> but for now back to Claire to finish off the the the, the conversation yeah we have to have a, a, a an Ian and then an opposite to Ian someone who's like yay hybrid <laughs> you have to have the different view but Ian's yeah. like mm, the, the hybrid, optimist hybrid, I'm, I'm, I'm the it. pessimistic realist yeah <laughs> Yes, you have a pessimistic realist and we have a, a really optimistic hybrid person on that would work perfectly. Thanks, guys. So you were actually going to say something, somebody, and then I interrupted you. Who was talking? We were talking about the policing. That was only Someone me about to just add it? off the back of um, the point we were discussing um, about identifying somebody with symptoms. And it can it is just as simple for us briefing our staff. And it's a key piece of that communication messaging in advance of an event, self risk assess as you get up in the morning before you come to your event, self risk assess, tick off those symptoms. How am I feeling? You used to get a hero badge when you rocked up suffering with a cold or flu. You don't get a hero badge anymore. You get kicked out. So mm -hmm. it is it is just as simple as that. Self -risk and, also, and partly it's that's a huge part of the communication piece that you guys were talking about that you know there's so much more communication before during and after an event because also the other after bit is the track and trace bit because you have all these people turning up at your venue and then something does happen and you discover afterwards that there's a number of people had COVID there's a whole piece of work there that you've got to deliver and again all these costs that are being borne by you guys essentially yeah, Rob. There's another, there's an, a, a, another risk um, for event organisers associated with this, and that's the, the lack of availability of a venue. So I, I'd be interested to know from Leon and Ella actually, if you have if you have identified that um, an event has, or, or if, if you've identified that there is someone in the building who has COVID-19 symptoms or you know that an event which is going on is suddenly currently creating issues, A, are you going to shut that event down? Um, and B, how what's the likelihood that you're going to then have to bring in a team to do a more thorough clean before you can open again? And then what is the potential impact that on that on the next client? I'm going to let Ella answer that one. She's written the policies. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dependent on the situation, of course. But um, if someone does experience or does demonstrate that they have symptoms, then we do have the necessary rooms away from the event that, um, that we're able to quarantine them in and we can utilise also, uh, obviously, hotel on site so we can utilise Celtic Manor to facilitate quarantine as well um, but aside from that um, it wouldn't necessarily need to be a time frame um, a longer time frame before the next event it just depends how quickly we can get 
staff in to deep clean and we're doing all the deep clean necessary anyway um, so it wouldn't be any additional cleaning on top of that we've already got the procedures in place for um, if anyone did have symptoms in case they did and we didn't realize in case they were asymptomatic in case anyone demonstrating um, symptoms might have something else not even COVID so we don't actually know um, and essentially the track and trace piece is a minefield I can tell you that now but it'll be very dependent on our local authority and the assistance of them to be able to help us in tracing everyone and the event organizers and the crew and it, it opens a huge huge workforce that we'll have to um, work together and trying to find everyone involved. And I have to say I agree with that because if, if somebody comes down with with COVID on site if track and trace is working properly everybody in theory who is in that room is going to have to self-isolate for a week or 10 days or two weeks whatever the, the rules are having the world is so fragile at the moment having just got back to work and, and if you're a freelancer say a, a freelance sound engineer whatever if you've then got to go and self-isolate for two weeks and not work because somebody in the audience has developed the symptoms it's just it's not viable to go back to work it really isn't i mean my my main worry is that we are going to lose so many people from the industry before the end of this because they cannot afford to stay in the industry you know many many of my freelance friends have not sent out an invoice since end of february you know, and they are living on lentil. I'm not joking. They are living on lentils every day because that's all they can afford. Um, you know, any grants they can get are going to pay tax bills. So, so it's, it's safety of everybody. And, and it's the whole quarantine thing. You can shut down a hundred people in an audience and you can take those people out of, out of the, the world for, for two weeks. And we just can't afford to do that. But essentially yeah, it's people aren't going to do it, are they? It would be something that we'd try and avoid. Like if there was one case, then it wouldn't necessarily be um, the whole event that gets shut down. Um, you'd work towards being able to isolate that case rather than have everyone affected because they might not all be close contacts. So you would be working towards trying to minimise and mitigate how many people you isolate as well as making sure you've isolated enough people to be able to facilitate a safe environment still. You quoted to me yesterday, Alice, something quite interesting. Close contact is defined as less than one metre for more so than a minute. Is that right? Yeah. So, so if, if you you're use that rule of thumb. Meter for more than a minute, or if you're, un if you're two metres and under for more than 15 minutes, that's how you're, well, in Wales, sure, that's how you're... Um, um, prior, that's how you meet the criteria of a close contact so you would work around that and it's not impossible but it is very challenging to be able to track everyone in your venue at any one time um, at any one place especially when you've got a venue as big as ours but um, it's something that we will have to look into and we will have to make happen because otherwise you're just like Ian says you're shutting down whole events, you're shutting down whole livelihoods, you'll even shut down our venue um, as big as it is um, if we have to isolate everyone, that's all of our staff as well. So it will impact not only that event but future events. Uh, can, can, I, can I ask Rob <laughs> so, H a question? It's so depressing actually. guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Rob H, the, the track and trace thing, obviously you go into a pub, you go into a venue, you give them your, your name, your phone number. Um, Ella, as you've just been saying, you've got to be within a metre for a minute or two metres for 15 minutes. Without the, the electronic track and tracing that the government were trying to put in place with, with mobile phones and Bluetooth, etc. Rob, from your point of view, how, how is that possible to, to even work out? How would I know if I've been within two metres of somebody for 15 minutes whilst sitting in a conference environment unless we have named names on every seat it's very hard i mean and i've i've been slightly confused by the irony of as event organizers we know who our delegates are where they've come from usually how they've traveled there where they're staying what room they were in what they ate for dinner how they're getting home 
and we've got a way to communicate with them, which quite frankly, not all of the pubs and restaurants certainly do. They're relying on people scanning a barcode or whatever it is. You don't know who you're sitting next to. You know, you don't even know if you were queuing up to buy a coffee, register for the event, queue for the toilets. Who knows? You might have been in that situation of less than a, uh, less than a minute or more than a minute or whatever it is. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of people wearing masks because although we would, as, as a safety person, I would always tell you that PPE is the last consideration. It is something that is easy to understand and easy to achieve. But at that point, one of the questions I think earlier was, uh, how do we still maintain the feeling of the event and the, 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 um, the sort of face-to-face -face interaction that we're all about when half your face is covered by a mask? I go into a petrol station, I normally smile at the person behind the counter just as a greeting or whatever. I can't do that because I look like I'm about to rob them. It's not great. Um, so it's, it's hard. I, I, I don't have specific answers and I'm hopeful that more information, again for England, uh, will, will come out for the 1st of October or, or, or probably just before I would imagine to give us, because as I was listening to everything we're saying, I'm thinking about liability. If I'm a freelancer and I can't work for the next two weeks and I've been working for you, Ian, do I say, well, Ian, you put me in a place of danger. So therefore, um, I, I want my two weeks money because I can't go work on the next three or four jobs yeah. that I've been on. Um, what do you then do with that? Is that a claim? So I think there needs to be a lot more guidance around uh, as employers, as um, organisers, as venues, where those liabilities are. We all have to undertake our own risk assessment and our own responsibility for uh, our own uh, movement, our own attitude to this. But there's always going to be the other person in the room or the other person, whatever, that you've got to worry about that you just don't know. And of course, to really put the icing on the cake, uh, we've got those that are asymptomatic. Is it 20% of the population they think have had it but don't know that they've had it? But, uh, you can't, you can't just, you can't uh, work with that. That's even more difficult. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm conscious we've gone into a very dark place. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, the, to, it's nearly the end. The mood, so though, someone lighten the mood, please. Well, we, <laughs> That's your so we job, Claire. You're good at that. that <laughs> we already have events that are live. We've been running uh, a couple of driving movies, one in North London, one uh, down at Goodwood. They're going very well. Um, we're expanding those now so that people can get out of their cars and they can, they can sit and watch it in a deck chair or they can bring their bike or whatever. So live events for us did stop, but they, they, have, uh, they have been... Uh, coming back slowly we are now looking at corporates we're now looking at um other kinds of things and then our our big piece of work for next year now is outdoor events summer 2021 even some of the stuff we would normally do indoors is moving outside because i think the clients are more confident in their abilities to deliver festival style environments even in a in a corporate or an immersive world than they would be doing inside and i suspect that that's where it's gonna it's gonna go of course we then got the british weather to to contend with but <laughs> that'll just wash away the crowd. but that's one that's one consistency that we have is that it is if you don't think it's going to rain it will rain and if it doesn't you know so you can plan for the weather almost we do plan for the weather in, in the uk we've always done that that's always been part of our risk assessment that's the easy bit rob you had your hand up yeah Unless it's I, something nice don't say yeah no, no no it is actually and it's really positive and it's one of the things i, I really wanted to get out of this when putting this together was what uh, trying to understand what we can do and actually, and I would say yeah. particularly down to um, Leon and Ella, I now have a much better understanding of what we can do in an event. And I think, that I'm hoping that more people will, 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 will watch this afterwards. You know, we, we've had, we had 40 people um, attending today. But for me, the outcome is really positive in that we can, it's not as bad as we, 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 we perceive it is, so long as we go through the correct planning process. I think it's, you know, the fact that everyone's shared so much about what all the planning is, it's, got, it's starting to give a bigger picture. Everyone's going to become a lot clearer of what they have to do. And this is, again, it's the beginning of this. So it's always going to have teething problems. And I think, you know, there's a lot of cultural buy and you have to get your your attendees to follow the processes you have to get everybody to be grown up about it and it's going to take a while where everyone beds in and then i think you know in six months time it will be normal to go to an event and take on these on take on these specific things that you have to do and you'll just start to find that normal you won't chafe against it it'll just be the way it is but it's going you know we now we're used to queuing outside supermarkets who ever knew that was going to happen so it, we can adapt we are quite good at changing it just takes a little bit of while. 
So we are literally at 40. I'd like to finish precisely. I used to read the news. Um, thank you so much to everybody. It's been so interesting to talk to you all and to find out what you're planning. Events. Well, Claire, we, um, we, conversations about hybrid. Claire, we're starting to lose you, so I'm. Are you? I feel like I'm losing thank, myself. Um, thank you very much for attending, everybody. Um, we'll see you again at the end of um, end of September. Have a fantastic summer break. I hope you all take some time off to enjoy yourselves. And as Rob was saying, we need to really look up the, the, look after ourselves. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye.